Welcome to the Rock the Stage Show. Each week, international media expert Rich Bontrager has in-depth and personal conversations with celebrities, top leaders, authors, speakers, and media professionals. Now, from the Rock the Stage studios, here's your host, the Trigger, Rich Bontrager. Welcome back to Rock the Stage Show. Sunday night, it's Rich Bontrager, the Trigger with you, and you are in for a treat tonight. We're going to pick up where we left off last week with part one of our special series here, The Boogeyman Gangster Redemption Story. Tonight is part two of that. We will continue our conversation with Gunnar Allen Lindboom. Now, Gunnar was part of the mob in Detroit. He was raised in a mobster family. He served time in prison. And during that time, he also became an author. In fact, he penned nine books during that time. One of them is To Be a King. It's a two-part book series. You want to check that out. But extortion, bank robbery, many other crimes, that's what he was a part of. And he spent 13.3 years in prison and then came out and started a whole new life. Tonight, we're going to jump back into the story where he was beginning to realize life is not good in prison. Things are getting worse and worse. And eventually, you're going to hear an amazing story of transformation and the life that he gets to lead now, free and forgiven. Let's get back into part two of our story tonight. The Boogeyman, Gangster Redemption, part two. Yeah. What was it like to walk down the street and know you're the boogeyman and everyone knows you're the boogeyman? What's it like to honestly be in that space? It's not good, man. Not good. It's uh, it's not good. It's, it's a, you hate yourself. You hate what you've come to. You hate what you've resorted to. You hate that everybody around you is scared of you. You hate that you're a scumbag criminal, robbing, using drugs, dealing with scumbags. You got to drive around like a predator all day long, looking for people to rob and things to steal and what hustles. And it was, it was hor- It's a horrible existence, horrible existence. And it's painful. And, and, but every day when I got in my car, I leave in the morning and I put a shirt and tie on or a suit, kiss my girl goodbye put a pistol in my waist. You always go, why you got that pistol? I'm like, yeah, better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. And I do, bro, I've been shot. I had a gun yeah. put to my head uh, and I've been shot a couple times. I had a guy put a gun to my head and pulled the trigger and it went click. And so, I mean, it, I, yeah, that's, it's, it's great. Cra- I'll tell you that story in a second, but, but I would leave the house and get in my car and I'd back out and I turn the stereo down and I would pray for 20 minutes. So, you know, your dirty deeds, you know, you're the boogeyman. But you're asking God to protect you, and you know you're going to go do dirty deeds. That's How the irony. How complex is that for you to pray for God's God protection and go do it? God loved me regardless. God oh, protected true. me. God protected me because I sought his protection. That's why I'm alive, bro. That, that's yeah. what I'm saying. It's just, uh, uh, let me tell you about the two times. One time I got yeah. shot. I was, robbing a, I was robbing a drug dealer of a, a quarter kilo of heroin, $20,000. I didn't like the guy. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to rob this dude. So I'm going to, I'm going to get him. So yep. I said, meet me at the Coney Island and parking lot behind Coney Island and, and on uh, outer drive and Harbor. Meet me in the back. I pull up my Jeep. I got a nice new Jeep and I get out of the car. We get between the cars. He, he reaches in the back, grabs a paper bag. You know, it's a big hunk of heroin. I, I, I hand him $20,000 folded over in a big knot like this. And uh, he stuffs it in his jacket. And I throw the heroin in the back seat, and we talk for a second or two. And I said, and then I, and he says, "All right, man, I'm out, whatever." And he goes to turn around to walk away, and I grab him by the coat, and I said, "Give me the coat." And I put the gun; it was right under his chin. Like, give me the coat. And he's like, "You serious, man? You serious? You really doing this?" I said, "Yeah, bro." I said, "Live to see another day." I said, "Live to see another day." So, listen, he. So he says, "All right," starts peeling. He had money, he had a lot of money. So to him, the twenty thousand was like, "Hey, we're dying for." Him. So right. he peels out of his jacket, but as he's peeling out of his, pulling out of his jacket, he like, like this, he pulls a gun and he starts firing the gun as he's raising it. A oh, big mistake. So he's like, he pulls his gun and I kind of grab the jacket and then he comes around, bang, 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 bang. So it gets off like four shots. The first oh. shot hit the ground. Second shot hit me in the shin. The third shot hit me in my leather coat. 
and I found it in the pocket of the other side. It, like went in and wrapped around, and ended up in the other side. I didn't figure that out for like a week when I felt it there. I was like, what is that? And uh, then I was like, I, I figured it out. Like I, I cut it out, and like it's a bullet in my, in my coat. I'm like, oh, the fourth shot jammed. As the fourth shot came up to my chest, it went click. So he goes bang, 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 and all of a sudden it jams right at my chest. I'm dead the right guy. Like I'm, 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 I, I'm dead. I know he got me. He got the draw on me. I, I got a gun in my hand. So at this point, I'm just like, boom, 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 boom. I start lighting him up. He takes off running, and I shoot, empty a magazine, jump in the car, take off. I live. No idea what happened to him. But now, fast forward a couple years, year and a half, another time. I'm dealing with these dudes in the hood. Um, and I've been buying cocaine from them for a while because I have a cousin who's rocking up cocaine and selling it out in the suburbs. So he's buying a couple ounces from me every day, which is easy. I'm making like 800 bucks a day from, from this one buyer. <sighs> I should have been buying like kilos and that way I could have I not had to do this run every few days. But anyways, I show up one day and I'm negotiating the price with this drug dealer who looked like the basketball player, Grant Hill, if you if you follow basketball. Yes, but he I did. Like Grant. Yeah, Grant, he looked like Grant Hill. Um, and he was a nice enough guy, I thought. And we're parked in front of his house. He, did, he had dope house across the street. And as I, we're negotiating, I see dudes in the window and they're looking and like at the dope house. What are they looking at? I had a funny feeling because he says he's trying to get me to pay an extra couple hundred bucks. I said, no, I'll buy it from somebody else. He says, all right, all right, Ryan, I'll go wait up. Give me a minute. Like 20 minutes go by. I'm nervous. So I, I back the car up. So I got a place to escape. I put the car in neutral. And so he comes out, gets in the car, slides in. He looks at me. Now these guys know I got a gun and they know I'm a gangster. They yeah. they know they know I'm just like them. Like I'm I'm a gangster. Just because I'm white don't mean I, you know, I have to be played with. My gun is out. I always held like it was just out right here. Like so yep. as I'm talking, it's right there. And uh and he says, Listen, I need another five hundred or whatever it is. I said, What the hell? I'm not five hundred man. I go get it from Tony or somebody else. Now, at that moment I hear I feel this against the side of my head because I'm, I'm looking at him in the passenger seat of the car. The car's running. I, I feel this, and yep. I hear, don't move, mother effer. It's summertime, so my window's down. Yep. I hear, don't move, mother effer. And I, you know, I, I turn my head and look, and there's the barrel of a gun in my face right there. Yes. I, my instinct is that it's a joke. Like, I think his boy's just going, hey, I got you. Right. Right. Playing. But then he goes to rack around in the chamber. And he goes, shh, shh, and the gun jams. He's got it against my head, like right here. And he goes, shh, shh, and I see the bullet jam and sticking out of the breach. Well, I know that, dude, I reacted so fast. Like, you'd be shocked by self-preservation, the type of instincts and in, in reaction you'll have when you're pro self-preserving. And, and literally a half a second, I pull my gun and start aiming it at this guy, because I don't know if he's got a gun. Right. And like, I don't know, I don't know if he's drawing on me all in one mo movement. I go, I grab this guy's hand with, with a gun and just crush his hand and twist. And this guy dives out of the car. So I know he, he's not drawing on me. So before right. I, I was going to shoot him in the face if he had a gun, but he didn't, he dies out of the car. So I reach my gun up, aim where I think the face is. And I pull the trigger, bang, his hand goes limp. The gun falls in the back seat. I pull it, put it in drive and I drive off. Anyways, I got away. But so at okay, you have two near death experiences. Well, I have one guns, more you, you well, should probably well, hear. But 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 gun jams. Yeah. Do you pause after the adrenaline rush is over and go, thank you, God, for saving my butt? Or is that not even a part of it right now? No, no, I do. I I, I think I knew God had saved me. The the most remarkable one is same area. Same selling drugs where it shouldn't be. Uh, long story short, is I got into it with a dude, right, and ended up knocking him out in, in, in the street and like smashing him, right? So that dude knew that I, I, I bought my dope from you know, like it was heroin, I was selling heroin at the time from a guy down the block named Lorenzo. And I pulled up later that night, and these dudes came out of an abandoned house. And one hit me in the back of the head with a baseball bat. I turned around to see what the hell just smashed off my head. And if you, you can see, there's a scar right here. Yeah. And um, he broke the bat over my head, knocked me against the car. 
I thought he was trying to kill me naturally. So I grabbed him by the throat and tackled him. I start choking him. I'm crushing his throat with all my strength. Just crushing his throat, blood mm. squirting out of his nose and his mouth. I'm slamming his head off the ground saying, you tried to kill me. You tried to kill me. His boys are kicking me. One of them stabs me in the chest. One of them hits me with a 40 ouncer. After my head's leaking everywhere because I got hit with a bottle. And uh, I don't even know they stabbed me. I'm just trying to kill this dude. And then um, I see a guy coming with a big two by four. And he's like winding up with it. So I lunge forward. He comes down across the back of my leg, tears my hamstring off the bone. Literally just tears my hamstring. Could barely walk for a month. But I run. I run for like three blocks. They chase me and I run. So I see a faucet on the side. This is going to blow your mind. I, I see a faucet on the side of some house. It, there's a vacant lot and then there's a house with a faucet. I'm so thirsty. I go walking up to this house and I get to buy the faucet and it don't work. I'm trying to get the water out of it. But then I hear some lady going, hey, get away from my house. Get away from my house. Some lady screaming at me. Get away from my yes. house. But she's across the street and down a couple hours. Where'd she come from? I jump up and I say, hey, man, I'm sorry. I just wanted some water. I just wanted some water. And she comes walking up. This kind of not heavy set, but like not thin. Yeah. Maybe 30, 35 year old black woman, maybe 40. Um, she comes walking up. She goes, damn baby, what happened to you? And I'm like, she said, you get in a car accident? I said, no, I got jumped. I said, I just want some water. And she says, come here, come here, come here up on my porch. So she walks me up on the porch. At this point, I'm completely cogent. I, I'm aware of my surroundings. I'm not yeah. delusional. Uh, she sets me down in a green chair, like a, like a green plastic chair. There's two of them. There's a green and white awning. The house is white, small white house with green and white trim. I sit down. She comes out with a this is really remarkable to me that she comes out with a, a perfectly clean, crystal clear glass of ice water. Almost instantly, she appears with this glass, ice water. And you're not expecting like that in the ghetto. You know, I'm no. like, like I, I, I don't have glasses this clean at my house. You know what I'm saying? Let yeah. alone in the hood. In the hood. So, and then she, then she says here and hands me a towel, a white, I'm talking hotel white starched towel she says, put that over that over your head because she saw that was where all the blood was pouring from. Ah. She didn't know I was stabbed because there's so much blood all over me. And she, I'm looking at, I remember looking at this towel because this is the cleanest towel I've ever seen in a glass of water. Said, it's crazy. And now I'm in the hood. And then I kind of, I drank the water and asked her for another glass. She brought me another glass. I took a sip, set it down, and then I'm out. Next thing you know, the EMS is there. I might have been out 45 minutes. They take me to the hospital. Doctor stitches me up. His name is Dr. Wheaton. I remember to this day. Gunner, you just told us several horrendous stories. When you think about it, the violence, the blood, and especially the, the last story, you really should have been dead. There's no reason for you to be here now, except for this lady that appears out of nowhere. This has got to have an impact on you. This has got to begin to mold you a little bit that you should not be here anymore, except for the grace of God, except for this angel, right? So I didn't have a ton of money at the time, you know, right. this is one of those spells where I was on drugs. I was still hustling and making money, but I didn't have a lot of spare money. You know, I had a couple. So I remember going, I, I got $2,000 like I can spare to my name. Right. I'm going to give it to that woman. I'm going to yeah. give it to that woman for saving my life. Yeah. So I jump in my car and I drive back there. I know it's only, it can't be more than two or three blocks over from where I ran from. Cause I only went to the box, maybe four, it could be five. I don't know. But I think it was like three. I drive up and down every block every street at least 10 times i can't find the house the house to, it's gone the house don't exist then i start to think this lady was an angel this one this woman was an angel yeah. god sent god sent this angel to save my life so gunner you really do believe this one was an angel you you are truly touched by an angel in this case but also through that this has got to really start bringing you back to your early god experiences your early faith journey You've got to really begin to think about what's really going on. So let's jump ahead a little bit in your story. You eventually get locked up. You get caught. So how do you get caught? Well, the day I get arrested is my girlfriend or fiance, who I'd been with for 13 years at the time, um, says to me, it's bill day. I'm upstairs getting dressed. It's like, it's bill day and it's tax day. And I'm like, well, how much is my half? She's like, 2200 I look in my pocket. I got 700 bucks. I'm almost out of dope, but I got only 700 bucks. So I go downstairs. I give her a kiss. I hand her 700 bucks. I said, I'm going to run up to the bank, get the rest of the money. She says, she, okay. But she looked at my gun and looked at me and did this. 
I had a stolen vehicle that I stole from a car lot. Okay. I stole it from the car lot by walking in there saying, I want to test drive this car. And th- what they would do is take a, a copy of your ID, yep. uh, your license, and say, hey, go have drive it around. Yep. And uh, But I, the ID was fake. So I gave them a fake ID. And then I just keep the car. Now, yeah. I, and, I, and I just use it for criminal activities for a week or two. And then I'd sell it for 500 bucks to somebody in the hood. Yeah. So I got this car because she'd ask me, whose car is that? I'm like, that's my friend. You let me use it. Said, your friend just let me use this car. And I'm like, yeah, no, don't worry about it. <laughs> One time she said, why has it got a dealer plate on it? I'm like, oh, he works at the dealership. <laughs> but uh, so I jump in the car and I drive to the bank, Comerica Bank in St. Clair Shores. And I walk in. I got a little uh, bag, uh, paper bag under my arm. Yeah. And I walk up and I grab a withdrawal slip from the counter back there. Yep. And I write a note on it. And it says, there's a bomb in the bank. You have 90 seconds to give me $75,000 or the bank goes boom and everybody in it. Something like that. And and then I take out of the bag a fake bomb that I made out of a drill set. So it's got wires sticking out of it and stuff. It looks pretty authentic. So I set it right on the counter where I was so they can all see it. Everyone up there can see it. Then I get in my car, drive back to the drive-thru, take the note, put it in the pneumatic thing. Yep. And I say it's 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 remote detonated by my phone. So I I don't look at them. I just hold my phone up like this and I look at my watch, look at my wit, and I look at my watch and look like this. Now they're in the bank. Just oh scratch. yeah. So so they're just they see the bomb. They go they stuff as much money as they can get in that thing within you know within ninety seconds and yeah. comes out. I grab it. I put it in the driver's seat. I take off. Okay, got her. This all like gets right out of a movie, but. You need to pay rent. So your idea is, this is your, you think it's great to go to the bank nearby and rob the place in your car that's not your car that you're ripped off. So you actually go there with a fake bomb, give them a note, and try to hold up the place. And and, and then you take off. You think you're just going to get away with this. It sounds completely crazy when you say it the way you said it. So what happened then? Like a dumbass, excuse my French, I should have thrown that pneumatic thing out, but there's a tracking yeah. device in it. Yeah. So if I would have just thrown that, I would have been fine. But the problem is there was a tracking device on it. So it wasn't within 10 minutes, I'm in a high-speed chase. I get in a major high-speed chase. I'm driving like a lunatic. I lose them. I mean, I'm driving like a lunatic, man. I blew a red light doing 100 miles an hour and did a Hail Mary through it. Like literally literally at a, at a red light at Beaconsfield. Yeah. I did this. And just right through it at 100. I lose them. They find me. I lose them. They find me. I'm like, how are they finding me? Not even thinking about the, 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 the bank thing. Yeah. Eventually, I crash the car, get out and run. They surround me with guns. I, I throw a gun. I surrender. They jump. They beat me up. They beat me half to death. Um, I mean, I'm a they mangled mess. They got to take me to the emergency room after they, they, they print me and stuff. And, yeah. And so that was it. That was my last day of freedom. So, so fast forward. About a month in to my, I'm in jail on a $5 million bond. So they're not right. letting me out. You know, they said I was a flight risk. I'm like, really? I have no money. I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm like, nobody. I'm a drug addict loser. You know? But, um, you know, I, I lived a pre- pretty pretentious life. So they probably, made, the investigator is probably like, oh, this guy's got Well, you're the off. boogeyman. The reputation says maybe I, I don't for I, you, probably. I mean, maybe I'm sure it's the FBI and some of the local cops knew who I was and my reputation, but they, they probably, they went and spoke to my girlfriend. They're like, wow, he's got a big house, got a bunch of toys, jet skis and four wheelers. He's got money, man. This guy's got loot, you know, but I didn't, and I was, I was just barely skimming along. But, um, anyways, so about a month in, I get in a fight, not really a fight. I did some guy steals from me while I'm at church. Uh, I come back from church. Somebody had gone in my box in my cell and took two pies I ended up learning who it was from his cellmate. Uh, it's this young black kid, kind of stocky kid. I went up there and said, you steal from me, man? He said, no, nah, man. I said, I'm going to check your box. He said, no, I'm di- no I feel disrespected. Wang, I-, I hit him in the eye, caved his whole orbital socket in. I know because I had to pay restitution for his ambulance ride. Yep. And um, just smashed him, knocked him out. And they put me in the hole. So I go to the hole for 30 days. So you serve time in the hole because you got in a fight, which this whole violence thing seems to be part of your life. So... You're trying to prove that no one messes with you. You're, you're trying to say you don't mess with gun or something's going to happen. But again, you're also at the lowest point of your life, I'm guessing, at this point. This has got to be the lowest low. You realize this is a dead-end trap. If you keep going where you're going, 
nothing good is going to happen. What happens? What changes? What, what gets you out of this that you now have this amazing new life in front of you? So I'm sitting there and I'm going, man, I, I, I'm not going to live like this, man. They're trying to give me 30 years. I said, I, I can't live like this. Like, there's right. no point. I'm not going to come out an old man with no family, friends, no money, no nothing. I'm a loser. Yep. I said, I'll just check out and kill myself. That, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to kill myself. They give you a razor once a week to sh shave in the shower. I'll pop this razor out, slip my wrist, sit down, and just pray my way out of there. I've never been scared to die. I've been shot twice. I've been, you know, stabbed and beat. And I've never been scared to die. Like, I, I, I welcome death at this point. Like, is this ain't no life, you know? Right. So I'm plotting this. And at some, and then at this moment, I, um, I looked at a letter on my bunk from my grandparents. And in one of her letters, I don't know if it was that one, she said, Alonzo, you write the most beautiful letters. You should be a writer. And I looked at my desk with all these books that I read. And I remember yeah. thinking to myself, every one of them, these books aren't that good. Like I could do better. I could be, I'm, and these are done. Sidney right. Sheldon and Tom Clancy and, you know, and Don Grisham. And I'm like, they're not even that good. Like I could do better. And then God spoke to my heart at that moment. He says, you are a writer. He's like, so listen, Tough it out. I'll get you through this. No matter what, I'll be there. I'll protect you. I'll get you through this. You use this talent I gave you. It's a special talent to create a future. And you're going to, you're going to be something someday and just believe that. And he told me without a doubt, it clicked in my mind. I knew it. I spent the next 14 months in that cell writing three books, three novels in my mind. That's, that's incredible. Gunner. You have God speak to you in some fashion, let you know that you're going to be a writer, an author. This is your God-given gift. But now you go from jail to serve 13 to 50 years in prison. You're not out. But God's told you you're going to be a writer, an author. It's pretty cool on one side, but it's pretty crazy on another side that you have these three books in your head, and you still have to serve time. So what do you do with it? What what happens with the books in your head and with everything else? This is where it's really going to blow your mind. There was a guy I robbed of like 10 pounds of weed eight years before this. His name was Joe. He's a bodybuilder. Nice guy. Real nice guy. Uh, not a tough guy at all. He's a very soft guy. But he looked tough, but he was super nice and soft. And he fronted me 10 pounds of weed, and I just said, you know, I'm not paying you. And he's just like, all right. And he never he never talked to me again. You know, I looked at it like this. He had hundreds of pounds of weed at the time. So what's 10 pounds? I ain't going to break him. 10 pounds, a lot of money for me. So you know, sorry about your luck. But um, that was the entitlement douchebag in me. So I don't hear from him again until I'm in, I get sentenced to prison. About a week after I get sentenced to prison, I get a letter from this guy. And he says, listen, I'm not a criminal no more. I'm not a drug dealer. I clean myself up. I moved to Chicago. I got a good job. I married a girl from my church choir. I'm a Christian now. Um, I've, I've changed my life. He's like, but I still read the Detroit news uh, every now and then to catch up on, you know, the old neighborhood. Yeah. And I saw in the news that you got all this time in prison and I felt terrible, man. Like I felt really bad for you. And then the next day I'm driving to work and the Holy spirit came over me. He says, and I began to cry and I never felt anything like this before, except the moment I gave my life to Christ, which is years earlier. He says, the Holy spirit convicted me and said, I want you to take care of this, your friend, Al. And this is somebody I did dirty. Right. Like, right. So, he says, so is there anything you, I can do for you? And I wrote him back and I said, yeah, man, I don't have any money for pens and paper, but I want to start writing books. Right. So he said, no problem. He sends me 30 bucks. I spent 20 on pens and paper. I spent the next 12 months writing my first novel called Second Chance. It's about these two high school football players. Very really good book. I sent it to him a year later. He's blown away. He's now... You take the train back and forth to work in Chicago. And so he's reading it. He's like, I, I all day I'm thinking about the book. I can't wait to get on the train to go home because I read the book. And in the morning, I can't, he's like, this is like the best book I've ever read. I cannot believe you wrote this. This is so good. I'm like, really? Thanks. 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 Uh, let's fast forward because, again, in prison, you did nine books. Yeah. And then the To Be a King series comes out. Yeah. You are now a legitimate, full-fledged author well, well, let me tell you that the most important part of my story, this was all setting yeah. up for the most important part. Everything I've said so far was a setup for what I'm about to tell you next. So I write about a book a year for the, for the first six years. I, on year six, I finished To Be a King. This is a novel series, two book series, novels yep. about a fictional mafia family. 
Um, it's the only mafia story I ever wrote. Uh, it was probably my sixth favorite book. I Meaning, I wrote five books before it, so right. it obviously it was my number six on my you know to do list. Um, but it was a great story, really good story. I sent it to Joe. He loves it. Thinks it's amazing. About this time, he says, "Hey man, um, I'm gonna." There's this thing called Facebook that just came out. I'm going to start a Facebook page for you. And I said, uh, what's Facebook? And he said, this thing, social media, it's new. It's this 2009, so it's just yeah. pretty new, Facebook. Yep. And, and he, he said, I'm going to put on there, you know, that you're a writer and a Christian, that you're in prison, and maybe some girls or some old friends from the neighborhood can write you in pen pal and whatever. I said, great, love that, appreciate it. He also posts, he puts on there, I'm a Christian, and then I'm a, in prison writing books. Then he posts some sample chapters. My Him and my buddy, Bill, manage my Facebook. And Billy puts up um, several sample chapters to the book. Mm -hmm. About this time, a girl, a woman uh, who works for a publisher in New York is scanning okay. and gets Facebook suggestions. It's a new novel thing. So everybody's yep. using it. And she sees my profile and she's like, you know what? I remember that kid, that dude from the neighborhood. He was a bad guy. He was a drug dealer. He liked to fight, tied to the mafia, all that stuff. So she writes me and says, hey, listen. Um, you probably don't remember me. I was just a book nerd, you know, from the from the neighborhood. We went to school together, but you would never remember me. Uh, but uh, I work for a publisher, and I work in academic publishing. But I have friends in commercial fiction. Uh, if, uh, if you want to have somebody sending me your manuscript, I'd be happy to read it and evaluate it, check it out. And if it's any good, maybe I help you get it published. And also, I'm a Christian, a new Christian, and maybe we can do some Bible studies. So I said, no, I'm like, dude, this is amazing. So yeah. you know, Joe sends me pictures of her. She's a cutie. And she's like 30, 33 years old. She's a cutie. And our, whatever she was, 35 maybe, 33, something like that. No, I think she was 33. Yeah, she was 33. And um, so we start writing back and forth. About a month in, we're really getting to know each other and opening up. And she's a remarkable woman. Tell, tell, incredibly smart and talented and you know, but, and she loves the outdoors like me and she's just got a lot in common. So there's a lot of me too moments. Then my boy sends her to PDF. She reads the full 1100 pages, meaning both volumes of the book in three right. days. She reads it and writes me a letter and she, and she says, in publishing, you have great writers sometimes, but, but uh, not the greatest stories. Once in a while you have a great story, but usually the writing's not good, but every once in a while you have a unicorn and you're yeah. the unicorn. She said, wow. you're a unicorn. She said, that's the best book I've ever read. It put, it brought me to tears at the end. I was crushed for three days after reading it. She, you are the best writer that I've ever read. I've read 10,000 books in my life. She's like, I'm going to help you get this book published. And I was like, thank you, God. You know? So so this all God's plan starting to fit together. So we start writing back and forth. We become good friends, pen pals. And over the next like nine months, we fall in love, me and this woman. Yeah. Fall in, fall in love through letters, right? Yep. And so about nine months in, we come to terms with this. We're, we're in love with each other. So what now? I said, well, you have, to, if you're going to wait, you got to be faithful. I can not, you know, not like you're going to date somebody else while I'm in here waiting. You know what I'm saying? It's, I still got six and a half years. Can you wait six right. and a half years faithfully? And she says, I could, and I will. I would do it. I'd wait 20 years. So I said, okay, cool. Then we commit to each other and six and a half years go by. She supports me the whole time, sends me money for commissary, money on the phone. We talk every day, two, three times. And, uh, you know, just we fall in love. I get out. I marry her the day after I get out. I get baptized 20 minutes later by Joe. The Joe is the guy, the guy that set, reached out to me and said, hey, the Holy Spirit told me to, to, to support yep. you. I don't know why. He's the one who started my Facebook page six years later. He's the one 13 years later who baptized me the, uh, and was a witness at my wedding. All God's plan. So she waits seven years. You get mm -hmm. married upon release in 2016. You get baptized. The book continues to grow, but you're also now got other media projects taking off as well. Briefly in a couple moments that we got left here today, kind of tease out what's coming next for you. Right now, the biggest thing that's happened in my life is a, there's a documentary uh, being made on my life, a big budget documentary. The, the, the director already has a big hit Netflix documentary on Netflix. Um, the producer's out of Sydney, Australia, just um, on my life story, the story I just shared with you, but yeah. more detail, they're going to reduce some, you know, some AI reenactments of some of these stories I shared um, more detail, you know, obviously dramatic scores and music and things that make it more, uh, you know, screen worthy. But, but anyways, yeah, that's my story. And then they want to um, make a scripted TV series out of it too. And um, one of the per people I'm working with is Armand Asante, the actor Armand yeah. Asante. He's going to be narrating in part some of the documentary. This is pretty cool. Um, he interviewed me in, in New York 
last year. And I think the, the director and producer are going to, uh, to have a conversation with him again um, about me, but they don't want me there because they say I'm intimidating. They're like, you're having your being, having you present is intimidating. And it can right. make people, uh, you know, a little edgy. So we're going to just go and ask him because when we've spoken to him on zoom calls alone without you there, he has remarkable insight about like what caused you to yeah. go astray and how, what changed you and how you are today. And the reason why I live in the middle of nowhere in Northern Michigan, way up in the wilderness on a 20 acre homestead. And I spent a lot of time uh, fishing, trout fishing and hunting. And I'm like being alone, you know, in the woods. And Armand is like, man, I understand that. Cause Armand lives on 240 acres about an hour from New York city. And, uh, and it's, but he lives in this remote chunk of, yeah paradise and he's like i need to be alone like he's like i can't imagine what you're going through as a, as a person as a man having seen the trauma and stuff that you've done. but i understand it you know like he's like and um so that need to be alone with god and nature and be left alone is how you 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 make it less dangerous for people to be around you <laughs> so he- as we wind down you're an author an entrepreneur a former convict People have listened to your story now. They've heard an amazing transformation, a tough story, a horrendous story, but a transformational story. How would you like to wind down tonight? What would you like to say to people that are hearing this for the first time that the boogeyman really isn't the boogeyman anymore? My point is at the end to say, hey, listen, everybody is worthy of a second chance. And no, no, no matter how bad you think you are or were or ever were or things you've done, you're not beyond redemption. Um, even if someone like me, who was the boogeyman, this bad guy, this horrible human being uh, on the surface anyways, um, can say, hey, man, enough is enough. I don't want that. I don't want that. Yeah. Like, I want to be a good guy. I want to be known as a good guy, a like, a likable guy, a kind guy, an empathetic guy, compassionate guy, a loving guy, a man of faith, a man of God. I want to be a good guy. That's who I've always been, always wanted to be. So why can't I be that guy? Well, you can be, and anyone can be. So my point is to share my story and just simply say, hey, listen, you know, I, I, I there's a few simple steps that I followed to change, but the biggest, most important one is self-value. Like once you realize you have great value to the world, the things to offer, you, whether it's your talent, your story, your abilities, whatever it is. When you realize that and everything that's happened to you in the past was for a reason, which is to like, fine tune you and polish you into the person you are now. Um, and you accept that and you realize, hey, this has value, man. People in the world like can be inspired by this. They can look at my story and go, dude. Like, hey amen. You found love in prison. You wrote nine novels in prison. You have this beautiful life tonight, day, you know, amazing wife. Um, you're healthy, you're living the dream, bro. Like, if you can do it, gangster guy, boogeyman, why can't I? And my 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 purpose is to say, you can. Anyone can, you can. So there it is. The two-part story of the boogeyman gangster redemption story, starring Gunner Allen. Lynn Bloom. Amazing. What a life from a mobster life, from a very hard upbringing life to now being an author, public speaker, and movies are going to be done about his story. But the biggest thing is his life of redemption. And that ending statement, he makes it no one's too far gone. Now, I know many people probably heard that, but that's an amazing place to land our show tonight. Of all the troubles, of all the trials, of all the near death, of all the court cases and drugs, he finds himself now with an amazing wife, a new career, a place that's peaceful and quiet away from the big city, and he's living a great new life. Thanks, Gunnar, for sharing your story tonight and for giving it hope and inspiration and for everyone to recall all that so we can know no one is too far gone. Hey, that's going to do it for tonight. I'm the Trigger Rich Bondry. Or come back next week for Rock the Stage Show every Sunday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. We go live with another story, a producer, a movie maker, an actress, keynote speaker from around the world. We bring the best of the best. And I want to give special thanks to, again, my show wrangler, Robert Stack. He's the one that got a hold of Gunner. He's the one that made this all happen. And we're just here to share the story. So, Robert, you outdid yourself once again. Thank you very much. And we'll see you back here again, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, Sunday nights, for another edition of Rock the State Show.